God, thank you so much for another morning, another day to gather together and to open our Bibles. What a gift and a treasure we have from you, your words in our own language, in a completed uh, form. It's just such a treasure trove of wisdom and blessing and life. God, as we continue to press forward in our study of sin, God, I pray that you would be glorified in our thoughts this morning, that you would bring conviction and bring clarity and understanding to whatever degree we already have those things, that you would only increase those things, that you would be honored as we turn our attention now to uh, the very words that you've spoken about such a dark subject as the nature of sin. And we pray that this would, this study would make us more like your son, that we would see sin more clearly, that we would be more eager to run far away from it so that you would be glorified, your gospel would be exalted and made known uh, in a way that is true to the actual message, that we would adorn uh, the gospel message as those who are putting off sin and winning, winning those hard-fought battles. And we pray and ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Why is sin sinful? Have you ever tried to answer that question? Why is sin sinful? How would you answer that question of what makes sin sinful? You might say because it's disobedience to God. 1 John 3, 4 says that sin is lawlessness, and that's true. But what makes sin lawlessness? What is it about the nature of sin that makes it inherently sinful? Every false religion would answer that question by pointing to some kind of harm that comes to earthly things, harm that comes to people, harm done to human flourishing and humans, uh, man's well-being, maybe to even animals or the earth in general or some other earthly thing. Our answer can't be that ultimately or merely. Is sin sinful because of what it does to people, because of what it does to man's well-being, uh, any way in which the creature is sinned against is not sinful because the creature is sinned against, you understand. If, if someone tells a lie, for example, bears false witness against their neighbor, why is that wrong? Certainly lying is wrong, bearing false witness against another is wrong, but why exactly? What makes it evil in the first place? Lying is not evil primarily because of the inherent worth of my neighbor. Right? My neighbor has no ability to make bearing false witness against them wrong any more than I have the ability to make lying or some other offense committed against me sinful. In general, deception is sinful because God is who God is, and ultimately, deception is sinful because God has said what God has said. Because of God's character, because of God's words, that is ultimately why deception and lying are sinful. See, it's the relationship that deception or lying, bearing false witness against another, it's the relationship of that sin to God himself that makes that sinful. When a person lies, he misrepresents God 
as his creator and or savior. And so in doing that, in, in misrepresenting God as a creator, as a savior, uh, the person is also failing to submit to God's words. God has commanded that this not be done. And however we treat God's words, you know, is how we treat God himself. Take another example, something as clearly wrong as adultery. Why is adultery sinful? What makes it so evil? Is adultery evil because it is a breaking of promises made at marriage? Well, no, not ultimately, not really. What makes it wrong? Adultery is wrong because like deception, its relationship to God is what makes it wrong. It misrepresents God and rejects what God has said about that institution of marriage. God created marriage. God made marriage good. He gave it as a blessing to man. And so he determined as its creator how it would best work. One man and one woman is the ideal for a lifetime. God intends it to display Christ's relationship with his church, and so really marriage is all about him. To corrupt the institution of marriage is against God primarily. The principle really regarding deception or adultery or any other sinful practice the principle is this, that sin is sinful because sin is against God. That's simple enough. Sin is sinful because sin is against God. This is so basic, but how easily do we forget this very fact, that what makes sin sin is it's contrary to God nature. The fact that we easily forget this comes out in our confessions of sin, does it not? When we confess sin to other people but fail to confess sin to God, we forget this very fact that sin is primarily against God. What makes sin sinful is it's against God nature. Or even when we confess sin, we fail to consider how we've sinned against God himself. The most important thing in our minds in a particular moment when we know we've offended someone can be the offense against that person rather than the offense of what we've done against God. That we forget this fact so easily also demonstrates itself in our motivations. When we fight sin, we realize that a particular sin is going to cause a lot of misery to ourselves and to others. And so we're motivated primarily to put it off for our own comfort or the comfort of others rather than for the pleasure of God to be pleasing to him. Even in you know, the fact that we forget this, this simple truth shows up in our even hatred for sin. Uh, we speak against sin in strong terms because of the inconvenience that it causes us or because of the harm that it does to others. And so we easily forget that the real reason we ought to even hate sin, the reason that sin is even bad is because ultimately it offends God. Over the next two or three weeks even, I want to help us think about this against God nature of sin, the against God nature of sin, that sin is against God, how sin is against God, why sin is against God. That's why we're using the title practical atheism. The argument that I want to lay out over the next few weeks is that lurking beneath every single sin, every sin that you have 
ever committed, the ones you're aware of, the ones you're not, lurking beneath every one of them, the heart behind every single one of those sins, whether it's been a sinful thought, word, deed, desire, motive, there is in each of them a practical atheism, a practical denial of God himself, a rejection of God. Every single sin is this, would fit into this category. We merely need to discover how. It was uh, Stephen Charnock who said that actions are a greater discovery of a principle than words. The testimony of works is louder and clearer than of words. And the frame of men's hearts must be measured by what they do rather than what they say. This is easy for, for us to understand. A husband says he loves his wife but gives no evidence of it. She's going to believe differently. If a wife says she respects her husband but lives contrary to that, then her husband is going to believe differently than what she says. And so the best way to determine whether or not we are practical atheists, whether we deny God practically, is to look at the works themselves, not what you would answer if someone asked you what you believed about God. If someone handed you a blank sheet of paper and asked you true or false questions, do you believe God is sovereign? True. Is God omniscient? Does he know all things? True. We would pass that test easily. But then, if we perpetually fail in an area like anxiety, better than an answer to a true or false test of whether we believe God is sovereign, whether we believe he's trustworthy, is to know how we respond in anxious moments, when we're tempted to be anxious. And in those moments, we will know everything we need to know about what we believe about God. The reality is, if God were, in truth, how we treat him, or if he were in truth according to our own works, there would soon be no God at all. If, we, if what was true about God, if the way we responded to God, and if our works told the full story, then God would soon cease to exist. Because at the heart of every sin is a practical atheism. Scripture makes clear from passages like Romans 1 that no one is an actual atheist. All men know that God exists, and there are people who know God exists, and there are people who live like they know that God exists. But no one is an actual atheist. God has made it too clear. He has embedded the knowledge of his own character in man, and so no one can fully weed out the knowledge of God that exists in him. Praise God. But to varying degrees, we choose to live like there is no God, or we choose to live like God is not who he has revealed himself to be. That is practical atheism. Why embark on a study like this? What's the benefit of discovering what is at the root of our sins, this lurking denial of God, this insidious atheism at the heart of all of our sins. Why? Well, for a number of reasons. This is going to help us, first off, grow in a hatred of sin. If you can articulate, if you can pinpoint for your own heart, when you practice or fall back into that pattern of 
sin that you hate, and you can pinpoint what is happening when that sin is practiced, what in your heart you are saying actually about God, that is only going to help you hate that sin. So you have to put two and two together. It's going to help us discern what is actually sinful, what is most sinful about our most besetting sins. If you can discover what your heart disposition is actually toward the God that you know that you love, then that's going to make you detest that sin. The more clearly we can see sin's ugliness, the more clearly we can see it's God-opposing sinfulness, then the more quickly we will be to put off that sin. And if you find that there's a sinful practice in your life that you have not made the connection to yet, how this is a denial of God, why this is practical atheism, and you find that you've been struggling with a long-standing sin, then this should be incredibly encouraging and comforting to you because perhaps the reason you have been so slow to put off that sin is because you have been failing to see exactly how sinful it is. We must learn to practice searching out the sinfulness of sin. This will help us to do that. Regarding the nature of sin, in his book, The Sinfulness of Sin, Ralph Venning says this about the against God nature of sin. You'll have this quote up for you on, on the projector. Venning says, as God is holy, all holy, only holy, altogether holy, and always holy, so sin is sinful, all sinful, only sinful, altogether sinful, and always sinful. As in God there is no evil, so in sin there is no good. God is the chiefest of goods, and sin is the chiefest of evils. As no good can be compared with God for goodness, so no evil can be compared with sin for evil. That is the nature of sin. It is that opposed, that unlike God. And there to begin to discover this practical atheism, this against God nature of sin, we should start where sin began in the beginning, in Genesis 3. So go to Genesis 3, open your Bibles there. We'll spend the rest of our time there this morning. In the event of the fall, we can see the practical atheism embedded in the nature of sin. Sin is against God. We can see sin sinfulness, that it is against God in the event of the fall as well as in the effects of the fall. And so we'll look at those two things this morning, the event of the fall and the effect of the fall. Starting in verse 1, I'll just read the account from Moses' pen of how this all took place. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which Yahweh God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, 
or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of Yahweh God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh God among the trees of the garden. Then Yahweh God called to the man, and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave from the tree, and I ate. Then Yahweh God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Yahweh God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, It shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, and you are for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. This is a a simple account of something monumental. This sets so much of human history on its course. Everything that we are familiar with in this life is affected by these simple 19 verses. When we were uh, in seminary learning to, to translate Hebrew, Genesis 3 was an early assignment, and it's something having... Uh, just learning the translation process, this took, for me, hours and hours to get through. And even though I knew what happened, I've read this numerous times, you're making these small discoveries in one painstaking word at a time, looking up much of the vocabulary, having to parse all of the verbs here. This was like, watching a slow car crash, you know the outcome, and yet you've got to go through the process slowly, watching it happen, and you're thinking, don't talk to the snake. Why are you saying that? It's agonizing watching this unfold one 
detail at a time. And yet, it's so simple. And yet, the lurking atheism, if you will, the, the practical denial of, rejection of God is just so profound in these short verses. This is just dripping with answers for a study like this. How is sin against God? Paul, in, a, in another passage in 1 Corinthians 10, tells us that what was written, what the, the events that are recorded in Scripture occurred for our instruction. They were cataloged, the specific events that were included in Scripture. Out of all of human history, God has given us a very small slice of what has happened throughout all of human history, but what was included in the scriptures for us was written for our instruction so that we would not crave evil the way that they did, so that we would not fall prey to the same sins that they did. This verse is no different. This passage tells us something about the nature of sin so that we can think rightly about our own. And so for starters, we can see the against God nature of sin, first off, in that sin is against the very works of God. Sin is against God's works. You ever wondered why, in verse 1, Satan takes the form of a serpent? Why? Why a snake? Why not just come the way uh, angels and other portions of Scripture have come as men? Or in another form, why, why a serpent? Uh, the answer to that question, I don't know. I have no idea. But what's interesting is to note that He's taking the form of another created thing. Uh, this is a perversion of what God intended snakes to do. God didn't intend snakes to tempt the woman to sin. Jesus in John uh, chapter 10, or chapter 8 rather, uh, called this murder from the beginning, that he would kill the man and woman, that they would die a spiritual death at his hands, at Satan's hands. That's not what snakes are supposed to do. So in terms of being against God's works, it works against the, the will of God for his own creation. Uh, not only animals, but even man. The goal here is the corruption of man. Verse 1, the serpent, being more crafty than any beast of the field, comes to the woman and says to the woman and begins to introduce doubt about what God has said. So Satan taking on the form of a serpent, a corruption of at least one animal, intends the corruption of another work of God, that is man. And in the corrupting man, who is the image bearer of God, can undermine the very image that God is intending, or that man, rather, is intended to bear. So this is a corruption of God's works. Animals, man, even think about the tree. Why, the, why is the tree there? Before the fall, before Genesis 3, Jump back just a few verses. Verse 16, Yahweh God, in chapter 2 of Genesis, commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. 
So there the tree is, put there by God, even before its fruit had been eaten. What purpose did it serve? Was it just there to be a temptation for man? No. The tree, so long as it stood in the midst of the garden with its fruit uneaten, the tree was actually a powerful reminder that man was worthy of God's, or God, excuse me, was worthy of man's obedience. The tree, when it was uneaten, stood there in the middle of the garden to exalt God's authority over man. It wasn't until the fruit was actually taken and eaten by Adam and Eve that the tree said something else. God is, no, God is not worthy of obedience. Man can be autonomous. Man can do his own will. The tree was, we shouldn't remember that after God had created everything, what does he say? Chapter 1, verse 31, God saw all that he had made, that includes the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, being there and off limits, was good. It was good that this was this tree existed, it was good that, that it was off limits for man. God's glory was displayed in the tree. Even if you jump down to verse 6, she, the, the woman makes this determination. She sees the tree is good for food. It was a delight to the eyes. It was desirable to make one wise. There's even beauty in the tree. It looks good. God's done a good job as the creator in fashioning this tree. So God's creativity is on display in that tree that's off limits. Sin, even the, the sinner in Satan, is displaying that in the nature of sin, sin is against God's works not the only way sin is against God. Sin is also against God's word. Sin is against God's word. In verse 1, the serpent asks the woman this question, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any or every tree of the garden? Is that true? Really? Really? Did, is that really what God said? With a simple question, I'm just asking questions. Yeah, embedded in the question is a sinister motive. And in this question, the against God nature of this question, uh, it just demonstrates, just in these few words, the Satan is, the, the serpent is calling into question the accuracy of what God has said, the truth of what God has said, the clarity of what God has said, the trustworthiness of what God has said the sufficiency of what God has said, the authority and goodness of what God has said, all of those things are being questioned, are being put on the table as if they're up for discussion and debate. That's never been up for discussion. God's word, from the moment he spoke it, were all of these things. They were accurate, they were true, they were clear, they were trustworthy, they were sufficient, they were authoritative. How do we know that? 
he's been speaking from verse 3. Let there be light. Was God's word accurate when he said, let there be light? Well, yes, those words were accurate. They were the perfect words to speak at that time. And what God had in his mind when he communicated accurately came to be because the very next words that we encounter in chapter 1, verse 3, and there was light. Not something else, light. God was accurate. God was clear. Sin, the nature of sin is that it is against God's word. When you disobey, think about disobedience to explicit commands of God, like commands like from every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Commands that are that clear. When we disobey those commands, what do we do? Are we not calling into question the goodness of God's command? Proverbs 6.25, do not desire her beauty in your heart, a woman you're not married to. Every time any person has failed at that point, he has, at least on a heart level, determined what God calls good to not desire beauty that does not belong to me. There's something better. That is practical atheism. God is not good. I am good. My words, my desires say something else. Sin is against God's works. Sin is against God's word. Thirdly, sin is against God's faithfulness. Sin is against God's faithfulness. There's this back and forth between verses 2 and 3, uh, 2 and 5, between the woman and the serpent. The determination, the result of this exchange is that the woman is deceived. She gives in wholesale to the temptation. She believes it. In verse 6 describes what, what she does, what she, what's happening in her heart. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable, to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. She is violating the principle that so clearly and popularly is articulated in Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Verse 7 says, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Well, instead, do what? Well, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Once you are wise in your own eyes, like Eve is here, the only thing left for you to do is to not fear God, And to not turn away from evil. No one has ever turned to evil who has not first been right in their own eyes, been wise in their own eyes. That's what's happening here. She comes to a determination that the tree is good for food. Well, it is a delight to the eyes, it is desirable to make one wise. It's worth taking. 
So in this, we see the against God's faithfulness nature of sin. God has been faithful. He is trustworthy. When he says, don't touch that, or don't eat that, rather, he can be trusted. He can be depended on. His determination about the tree, regardless of how it looks, is what Eve ought to be depending on. Instead of depending on what God has said is best, she comes to a different determination. She relies on her own understanding instead of trusting in God's trustworthiness and his faithfulness. Don't you do this when you doubt God's provision for you? God has only given you what he's given you and no more and no less. When we doubt that God has given us enough, are we not doubting or calling into question his character, whether it is trustworthy? God, I think what I need, I know you've only given me this, but what I think I need is, you haven't given me a wife, but what I think I need is, you haven't given me a husband, but what I have determined I need is, you have withheld perhaps children from me, but what I know I need is, that's a, a calling into question of God's faithfulness. So instead of trusting him, you trust yourself. In the heart, your heart is saying you cannot trust God. God is not trustworthy. He might be a lot of other things, but trustworthy is not one of them. That's atheism. Practically. This also got, doubts God's sufficiency in, in much the same way. God has only given Adam and Eve every other tree of the garden, which is incredibly generous, right? Every tree you can eat from except one. There's only one thing off limits for you, one law, and it gets broken. God is sufficiently, clearly sufficiently provided for them. They don't even have to make things grow to eat them. God just makes crops grow. Without their help, he causes a mist to rise from the ground. Food is already there for the taking. They can just have their fill of those things. Clearly, God has given enough. He is sufficient. His instructions have been sufficient in every other way that he's provided for them. And yet the one thing that he has put off limits, what do they do? They grasp for it. I want that too. This is a practical denial of God's own sufficiency that his instruction, his character, his person, that they are sufficient, uh, his provision, that they're sufficient. Likewise, whenever we grasp for something that is forbidden by God, this is a practical denial of God's sufficiency. Is God enough? Is what he said going to be enough? Is what he has given going to be enough for us? Even in a way, also, next, uh, this is against God's beauty. The woman, in verse 6, determines that um, what, what God has forbidden is delightful, uh, ought to be, to be taken, that it's a delight to the eyes, uh, in a way, Instead of being satisfied and determining that what God has called good is what she's going to call good, what God has called um, good to have in its the, the pleasing nature to the eyes, she's taken of it. She's determined that she's going to take of it. 
God's authority clearly is, is being cast off here in verse 6, also in verse 11. This is the express thing that God has said not to do. Verse 11, God even makes sure that they're reminded of this. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? He's commanded them as the creator who has authority over his creation. He has commanded them to do something. He has authority over them. They have cast off God's authority in this moment, taking the fruit and eating it. They have, in essence, told God, you don't get to tell me what to do. I don't have to take orders from you. I can do what I want. You think of your life as an unbeliever. Is this not how you live? You hated authority. You hated the thought of God being able to tell you what to do. The thought of being someone's slave is not appealing to any unbeliever. I mean, that just grates on our 21st century ears. A slave? Me? Yeah. We delight as believers to be slaves of God, slaves of righteousness, slaves of Christ. This uh, denial of God's authority, this hatred for God's authority is so common to all men that what Paul can say, one must, to, in order to be saved, Romans 10, 9, and 10, one must confess Jesus as Lord. This is the entryway into salvation to acknowledge that Jesus has authority over me to willingly bring yourself under his yoke. It's so counterintuitive to man's nature to, to be subject to God, to love God's authority, that God can say this is part and parcel with salvation. To acknowledge Jesus as Lord. There, there's even perhaps uh, in Eve, if she is truly doubting what God has already said, that on the day you eat of it, you will surely die. There could even be here a, an unbelief or a denial that God even has the authority to kill. God said, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. He doesn't have the power to do that. He doesn't have the authority to kill me. By unbelievers, as you know, they doubt that God has the authority to cast body and soul into hell, to destroy both body and soul in hell. It was Jonathan Edwards who said, every man who, almost every man who hears of hell doubts that he will go there, presumes on God's mercy, denies God's authority or his justice, which is the next point, that this is, a, this is against God's justice. Sin doubts that God will be just. It does not believe that God will be just in the ways that he has described. This is atheism in the heart. Let me give you another example of this that Paul gives in 1 Thessalonians 4. As a deterrent for believers against the sin of sexual immorality, he reminds them of God's justice. This is not just for unbelievers. This is for believers as a motivation to be holy to embrace God's plan for sexual purity. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 2, For you know what commandments 
we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who what? Do not know God, who act like atheists, who pretend like they don't know what God has revealed about himself. Don't act like people who don't know God. Why? That, that no man transgress and defraud his brother in this matter of sexual immorality? Why? Because the Lord is the avenger in all these things. Just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. Believers, solemnly warned, God is an avenger. Why? Are they at risk somehow of incurring the avenging wrath and justice of God? Well, no. As believers, they're not if they don't practice sexual immorality. The believer is not at risk of falling into the hands of God's justice and God's wrath because or he, rather he proves that he's not because he does not practice. He heeds the warning that God is an avenger and refuses to practice sexual immorality. Think of a believer in the church practicing sexual immorality and at the same time being convinced that verse 6 is not for him. The Lord's an avenger in all these things, but not for me. What is he doing there? The one who practices sexual immorality and yet also equally convinced he can do that and not ex experience the avenging wrath of God? He's denying that God is just. Against all reason, against the evidence of his own works, convincing himself that I'm still a believer even though I'm practicing the very things that God is going to avenge himself on those who practice them. This is mere unbelief. That, that one is living like one who does not know God. He is living like an atheist. This is, back in Genesis 3, also a denial of God's presence. You see that, um, or it's a rejection of, a hatred for God's presence. Because the very first thing that happens when they become sinners is they do what? Run from the presence of the Lord. They hide themselves from the presence of the Lord. No one who has run into sin has also desired that God be there. The one in sin hates the presence of God. To knowingly walk into any sinful practice, no one has ever done that and at the same time rightly thought God is here. This is why people are okay sinning in private, because they forget or refuse to think or suppress the truth of God's omnipresence. God is here with you. When I get to uh, counsel uh, the issue of pornography, I a often ask the person who's struggling, would you do this if your spouse, or would you do this if your parent, or would you do this if your child was in the room with you? Of course, not, never. By no means. Do you know, though, that God is in the room with you? Why comfortable doing it then and not when all of these lesser people, people who are lesser, less worthy of your obedience, why not do it when they're in the room? Well, it's because I fear them more than I fear God. I care about them knowing who I really am, but when they're not around, who cares? Not me. I don't care. It doesn't bother me that God knows, that God is there, 
So I, I get to live like God is not omnipresent. I deny his presence. Adam and Eve flee from the presence of God. Just like all sinners do when they sin. They delude themselves, not only that God is present, but also that God knows. So sin is against God's knowledge. It pretends that God will not discover the wrong and call it to account. I heard the sound of you in the garden, verse 10 says, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Did you not think God would not find out, Adam? Did you forget? Did you not consider? Even in verse 12, as Adam responds, the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Adam, rather than just answering the straightforward question in answering the question honestly, what does he do? He blame shifts. He blames God. It was the woman, so it's kind of like my wife's fault, that you gave me. And ultimately, you trace that fault from her back where? It goes further back to God in Adam's statement. You gave her to be with me. He would rather blame God for his sin than just take responsibility. Proverbs 19.3 says this, When a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. You sin, ruined your way, and you're mad at God about it? You're blaming God for your folly? So he would rather cast aspersion on God's own purity and holiness and blame him as if God is at fault for the sin. And when we make excuses for sin, are we not doing that same thing? When it's the the fault of my situation over which God is sovereign, that's the reason you sin? So it's really God's fault because he's orchestrated the, the universe in a way that made that the situation you were in? That's why you sin? That's not why you sin. But we blame God. James 1 says this is impossible. God cannot be tempted by sin, nor does he tempt anyone to sin. We, are, we sin when we are enticed and lured away by our own desires. Just to bring this to a close, the, the practical atheism is not only seen in the events as they unfold here, but it's also seen in the effects of the fall. Just think of all the ways that now God is being warred against uh, sin, brought things into uh, contradiction to God. Just a few ways to mention. Sin actually warranted God's judgment. That's one of the effects of the fall. So now God is angry, wrathful, judges the serpent, the woman, and man, and then the rest of creation he subjects to futility. It was because of the fall, secondly, that uh, God's death was required. This required God's own death. You can see sin is against God. We'll actually unpack that more next week. Because in the event of the cross, you just see what kind of person would kill God. Slanderers, covetous people, liars, they are the kinds of people, the kinds of sins that would put God himself to death. We'll talk more about that. Sin increased God's enemies by setting Adam and Eve and then the rest of their progeny against God. Colossians 1.21 says that we are alienated from God, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. And in a sense, this decreased God's sons. 
Adam was and is even called the son of God. He was a, a, as much as like God as one could be, being made in God's own image. And if he would have, he and Eve would have reproduced image bearers, then others would have borne the image of God, uh, being sons in that sense. But what do we get instead throughout Scripture? We are sons of wrath, children of disobedience, and sons of Satan, brood of vipers. So Satan has children rather than God by birth. Sin is against God. We would do well to give much more thought to how our sins are against God. What practically are we saying in our heart when we commit those sins? We ought to confess that lurking practical atheism to God and to others and let that make us more eager to put off sin. We'll continue that discussion next week. God, thank you so much for what your word reveals about the heinous and sinful nature of sin. We need to spend more time thinking about these things so that we grow in our hatred of sin and that, as Christ said, we would know exactly how much we have been forgiven. The one who is who is forgiven much, loves much. And we want to love you much, Lord. And so help us to discover the depth of the sins that you have forgiven so that we return uh, your forgiveness with love and praise and adoration and obedience to you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.